So this week we have Justin who will be speaking on higher category theory. Great. So from my experience walking on the team last week, I figured out this even I think the top board is like slightly blocked. There's have they moved? It's okay, it's well, visible. We we can interpolate what's on the far left there. But yeah, we can look at this only slightly. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try not to write too much on this. Um, but let me know if it's not clear. So the first thing I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about foundation prior theory. Uh, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in it because, well, uh, to kind of give all of the definitions carefully would just take way too long. And I really want to give the flavor of how one is supposed to think about these things more than um, uh, getting too deep into specific models and so on. Um, so the overall philosophy here, uh, very much related to this concept of uh, univalence, uh, sort of sometimes called, which is, uh, I guess there's different interpretations of this. There's sort of precise statements you can make, but philosophically, to me, this means like, uh, I guess one way of saying it would be, um, Abandoning the idea of equality, which somehow sounds very politically incorrect or something. So maybe I should say we we uh, don't make a distinction between strict equality and the concept of isomorphism, which I really said straight here. Um, so this is really the principle that underlies uh, higher category theory. So in contrast, um, in kind of standard zermelo frankel set theory, uh, well, the way things are set up, right? Everything is a set. And there's sort of two types of propositions. So either, again, yeah, kind of everything is a set, although we very often don't think about things that way, right? Like, that is kind of how the theory is set up. So either you can talk about membership, right? Some set is an element of another set, uh, or equality. Okay. And uh, crucially here, you know, there's a notion of bijection in set theory, and it is different from the notion of equality. So uh, to Specify a bijection. Between two sets uh, is is different. It's really kind of strictly weaker. From asserting the two sets are right. Well, for one thing, the former is a structure and the latter is a property, but in set theory, really, um, you know, saying that two sets are equal is a meaningful statement, and uh, uh, it's sort of strictly weaker than saying that a bijection exists. Um, okay, so all of this may seem very obvious, but this is somehow exactly the kind of, kind of the, and if you're setting up category theory, even the ordinary one category theory, right, we run into issues with this, um, which this whole concept of, uh, Evil, right? Where you talk about equality in situations that's kind of appropriate, and we just want to kind of avoid that at all costs, right? So, uh, and sometimes if you have foundations where there is no distinction between these two things, then it would be sort of perfectly adapted to our category. Um, okay, so maybe I'll say a little bit more about this issue of foundations um, later. But let me... So that was the like. Higher category theory for humanities majors section of the talk, and then we'll try to be a little bit more precise. Um, I saw that joke. Okay, so uh, okay, so we, we just talked a little bit about sets. So maybe something that's a little bit closer to uh, this idealized um, uh, concept I'm talking about is a one group. Right? So just like an ordinary groupoid that you read about in um, McLean's book or whatever. So it consists of the following data. You know, you have some collection of 
objects. Still have this, this notion kind of membership around. Um, maybe the thing I need to say comes up. Uh, for two objects x and y, there's a set, right, of all isomorphisms between x and y from x to y. And then you have a composition law. Which you know what I mean? And uh, this composition law has to satisfy some conditions, right? So so far, you know, this is kind of an improvement over just an abstract set in the sense that you know, in many situations, you don't just want to say the two things are equal, but you want to actually specify some isomorphism between them. Maybe there's multiple isomorphisms if you care which one. So there's some additional structure here. Um, however, uh, the composition law itself is required to um, satisfy some conditions, right? To be uh, unital and associative. Uh, uh, and I guess I should say, and have inverses, of course, to your point. Um, and these conditions, they're really conditions. They're strict equations, right? These are some equations um, uh, uh, between Isomorphisms. Between morphisms in the, in the group, right? So at the kind of level of objects, we can talk about isomorphisms between objects. This is sort of consistent with our, our univalent philosophy, but then uh, as soon as you talk about associativity, unitality, you're imposing certain equations. And again, we want to avoid this. Um, because in some situations you actually want to keep track of, you know, how do you uh, uh, see that two one morphisms are equal? Well, maybe in some situations it's not an equality at all, but an isomorphism. There's some additional data to keep. Right. So kind of continuing in this uh, uh, along this hierarchy, we talk about a two group void. Right. So in a two group void, these equations between I mean, one isomorphism. Is are replaced by uh, some additional structure, right? Which we call two isomorphisms. These are additional data. You know, so for example, like associativity, right? If I impose if I have three composable one morphisms, I compose first at the G and then with H, uh, I should actually identify this via some isomorphism, right, with the composite with the other grouping of um, parentheses. This kind of thing, as opposed to an equation, we have an additional structure there. Um, and then these, of course, must satisfy some, again, strict equations, right? So now we don't require strict equality between one isomorphisms, because we won't allow ourselves to talk about that. Um, but at the next level, we have to impose conditions between two isomorphisms, okay? So you can imagine continuing this process indefinitely. Can I ask? Yes, please. Sorry, you saying that the associated law is just that there exists an isomorphism between? No, it's an additional structure. It really, it's part of the structure of, the group, of a two group void. So two group void is really, it's this data, and then along with, uh, you know, for any three composable one morphisms, you have some associativity constraints, um, and then you also have the identity constraints, right? Um, unitality constraints, and then those are required to satisfy a whole bunch of conditions. Okay. Is the associated, is the associativity constraint just going to be there? Yeah, like for any three composable one morphisms, I give myself a two isomorphism like this. Just that there exists eight. 
No, no, no. I specify two ways. Oh, it's, it's, it's part of the structure of the two group. Okay. Yeah. Really part of the structure. Yeah. Just in the same sense, the composition law is part of the structure of the one. Group. Right. Um, okay, so it's a whole bunch of data. Um, this is uh, certainly can be written down by hand, and people uh, did it a long time ago, but it does quickly get unmanageable. And then as soon as you get beyond kind of three group weights, I think are really quite quite difficult to write down by hand. So you start to wonder, you know, am I, am I actually like keeping track of all of the possible coherence conditions? It's like a very difficult problem to keep track of all of that. So defining in group voids or in greater than two uh, uh, in this way, Is sort of unmanned. Make a statement that just quickly gets out of hand, especially if you're like me and you're bad at combinatorics. It's just really, really uh, hard to keep track of everything. Um, so, what we do instead let's sort of take the parameter in to infinity, which sounds like a crazy thing to do because it seems like that would just make things much more complicated, but in fact, it, it uh, uh, well, wait, simplifies things for the following reason. So, there's a principle that sort of guides us in how we, we take this step. It's called Grotenik's Homozoic Hypothesis. And it just says that uh, an infinity group void, okay, whatever that is, however we formulate this notion, could be the same thing as a space in the sense of homotopy. Okay, and all of a sudden we're in a much, much better position because these objects are. are Quite well understood in some sense. There are many concrete models, uh, ways of working with them, um, and so on. So let's do a sort of comparison chart to compare these two notions that you've got to over here. So today, so I'm going to go sorry, the board work. So I'm going to kind of flesh out this analogy. So I'm going to make kind of a little two column chart here. So um, one hand we have, as I said, kind of your points. So this would be the same thing, of course, on to uh, spaces. A functor, I mean, infinity group voids, which I, I didn't talk about the notion of functor between group voids, but it's just specialization of the idea of functor and Pythagoras, right? So you can imagine it could be a separate thing, it could be a natural notion of morphism between infinity group voids. And this, of course, corresponds to the continuous map of, of spaces. Continuous, maybe if you're thinking about them in the traditional way as point set topology or other models, what's kind of some other meaning, but it's kind of structure preserving that spaces, right? Uh, an equivalence of group voids. And this is really a key point here, should correspond to a homotopy equivalence of spaces. Yeah, this is where it's very important that I say points of the equivalence and not, again, if you think about things in terms of uh, point set topology, I'm talking about something much weaker than homeomorphism. Right? So like any Euclidean space or something like that would be the same thing as point from this perspective, trackable. Um, okay, and then inside of the group point, we have this additional structure. Uh, so first of all, we have one isomorphisms, right, between objects. 
the ones that are already present kind of in ordinary group voids, isomorphism between objects, these correspond in the world of spaces to paths. Okay, conceptually, right? And I, I guess I should have said before this, sorry, let me say so things kind of in proper order here. Sorry, before that, I should have said that an object in an infinity group void will correspond to a straight point, right? Space and a one isomorphism corresponds to a path between the corresponding points. Um, for example, I have like the identity, and this um, unitality condition um, says in particular that you have an identity object on any given an identity morphism on any given object, um, and this corresponds to sort of the constant path in the language of spaces. Composition of one isomorphism um, will then correspond to concatenation of paths. So far, all of this, uh, all of this is just the structure present in a one group void. You may have seen the construction of the fundamental group void of the space, right? Of course, this forgets a lot of information. You can think of the additional information enclosed in the or sort of contained in the space as being the sort of higher group voice structure. So beyond this, you have two isomorphisms. These would correspond to path of tokies. Tokies between paths, right? Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I should have said here, I was talking about one morphisms. Uh, you have this sort of inverse one isomorphism that corresponds to the reverse path. Well, in fact, one of the group, right? And then so on and so forth. So you can talk about three isomorphisms. These are uh, homotopies between path of the films. So maybe you can encode them as like a map or a cube or something like that, right? And so on and so forth. So whatever kind of model of, of spaces you use in, in moments of theory, whether it's some kind of nice class of CW complexes or nice class of spaces like CW complexes or sets or something like that. It, it's keeping track of all of this, all of this data and in some sense in a, in a coherent way. Okay. So um, here. So one can use nice uh, topological spaces like CW complexes or something like that. Okay. Um, alternatively, this is what it sets. Models. Uh, Nikolai, would you have the camera? Question. These are sort of uh, concrete models for this abstract thing that I'm trying to get at. Um, an advantage of this, this concrete model of simplicial sets. Um, so, the thing about using point set to pod, something like CW complexes. Um, uh, let, me, let me write this to say advantages of. Sets um, so again, if 
if I use something like CW complexes, I'm really appealing to the real numbers, the continuum, right? And like the kind of topology that we talk about when we talk about smooth manifolds and this kind of thing. But these, these spaces in the sense of homotopy theory, I want to claim, I don't think this is a controversial point, they're really purely combinatorial functions. Okay? They have nothing to do with it. It's really capturing this kind of algebraic data. Okay. Uh, you can do this using point set topology, but it's by no means necessary. So let's just say some special sets are purely combinatorial. So no real numbers involved, no continuum. Which like, you know, it's, this is a philosophical question that like whether I believe in real numbers kind of depends on which side of that I wake up on. So it's kind of nice to have just depend on that. Um, and um, another advantage of this as I'll mention again shortly is that some special sets uh, can be used to model uh, it could be one categories, which I'll talk about next. So, anyway, that's sort of this nice feature that we'll be able to put one categories in the same uh, framework as, as group lines and use this special set. So, if you're looking up, you know, models of spaces using conventional sets, I think the here is con complex. Uh, there's a whole kind of theory. But I won't really appeal to specific details of this theory because, again, it's things that I'm talking about are relatively invariant and they're not really uh, contingent on any one model. Okay. Uh, yes. So, are you saying that in this, uh, like the natural conditions are more associated with the automatically the structure of the space is not here? Yeah, and again, if you think about it in terms of point set topology, yeah, you'll see that all of these conditions, well, again, they'll hold up to some higher dimensional homotopy, okay? And then the coherence conditions you would impose there will hold again up to some higher dimensional homotopy and the chain kind of continues to be correct. So the data is just like automatically that Exactly, yeah. Um, and I think it's better to think about, again, the all the structure here is in some sense kind of present in the simplex. Simplex category really, is the universal thing that parameterizes associative structures, which categories certainly are an example, right? Um, and so, again, I think this perspective of using special sets um, still is a concrete model, but it seems kind of fundamental to me. And these, the simplex category is like, it is the thing that parameterizes associative algebras, monoids, um, categories, and things like that. Like if you think, I mean, simplices, you know, you have this picture of, of simplices in the Euclidean space or whatever, but the simplex category could be defined as like finite, totally ordered sense, right? And so this is exactly like the idea of, you know, I can, if I have an associated multiplication, I can multiply a string of things, the order matters, but I can identify things uh, like group the parentheses differently, it's exactly encoded by the simplex category. <clears throat> okay, other questions? I have a question um, from Zoom here. Um, the conditions on a topological space, um, they you see auto, even with them um, in concatenation of paths, that there's some kind of arbitrary choice of how to concatenate paths if you view a path as a map from the unit interval into the space. And so you still really do need to specify the homotopy. And so you already even see it at the level of just you know the arbitrariness of defining path concatenation, right? It, it isn't literally associative if you define it in the way of sort of doubling the speed down one path and then down the second, so that it's all exactly. Right. I mean, like using using point set topology, yeah. In that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. You already exactly. You already see you know the associativity only holds up to existence of path homotopy. So often in particular concrete models, you know, eventually you'll see some condition that holds in terms of a strict. Equality. Um, so, yeah. So, what I want to say is, like, these are different ways of encoding this um, kind of uh, this kind of structure and set theory. But I, it would be fantastic if there were some foundations that were better adapted to 
prior category theory and the specific theory. I think it's, it's clear when you look at set theory that it's really not uh, well adapted to such things. And, uh, even though we can encode it and prove things, um, I mean, a good definition it should sort of pack your own intuition it should correspond to the compilations you perform in your mind. And uh, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of excitement about homotopy type theory, which comes uh, close in some ways. Uh, it's, it turns out to be a very good way to, to talk about spaces, but um, the next step is to talk about infinity one categories to allow uh, um, one morphisms which are not invertible. And there, I think it's already an open problem such things, and I don't really know of any other you know, kind of synthetic or intrinsic foundations. So for now, you know, theory uh, would be great if somebody did, you know, set up some alternative foundations that are sort of more like this. Like if we had a foundation where literally like exhibiting a bijection was the same as saying two things, it's really just type theory. Right? All right, any other questions? So when I think about a space, I'm really not thinking about a space. I'm thinking about some kind of abstracted object. And I don't think this is really so weird. We do it all the time in math. The example I always like to give is, you know, in math 161 or whatever, you define the real numbers and you, you define them in some specific way, right? Using some specific model, whether it's uh, data can cuts or equivalent classic Koji sequences or something like that. But of course, no one actually thinks of that when they think of the real number. Right, the real number has some platonic existence that you allows you to think about it. Um, again, not really making a philosophical comment, but an operational one. And uh, and at some point, you just forget about the actual definition and work with the sort of notion satisfying some properties that allow us to work with it. And that's kind of the way that I recommend thinking about this stuff if you want to use it for applications and representation periods. <clears throat> of course, you need to be able to look things up. Learners fix that. Um, Okay, so uh, an infinity groupoid is uh, can also be called an infinity zero category. So the second index here, this means that um, n morphisms for n greater than zero are invert. Okay, so I can talk about like n comma k categories, something like that. In the second index that imposes this is imposes this invertibility match. So we're going to be really interested in um, infinity one categories. So an infinity one category is an infinity groupoid as like an ordinary category is an ordinary groupoid. So let me be informal here. Informally, uh, an, an infinity one category consists of maybe so I don't go too far down, I'll write it over here. So it starts out looking kind of like the definition of the ordinary category. And again, this is not a precise definition, it's very formal. So uh, you know, we have on one hand objects. So call my infinity one category C. So I'll we'll have objects in this category. Uh, and for any objects, I don't know, C1 and C2, infinity group void. Okay, these objects, right? These points, you think of it as space, are one more distance from C1 to C2. Okay, but already we have all of these higher homotopies built into the structure of this infinity groupoid. Um, and then for any C1, C2, C3, and C composition law. It's like in a usual category. OK, 
Okay, so again, looks much like the definition of an ordinary category, except morphisms between two objects form an infinity or void or, or space. Um, but the composition law, composition is required to be unital and associative, just like in a normal category. But here, I'm going to put the weasel words uh, up to coherent homotopy. And what this really means is that there's a ton of additional data here. Super right, so all of the structure that I talked about when I talked about two groupoids and going on up three groupoids and four groupoids and so on is present here, right? So instead of an associativity equation between three composable Involving three composable one morphisms, I have some associativity constraint, which is required to satisfy some coherence conditions, which are really themselves additional data, and so on and so forth. So, again, this is not a real definition exactly because of these weasel words, um, but it's a totally reasonable way to think about infinite categories. So, I'll come back in a moment to kind of the question of how to define them rigorously, but let me just say for the moment this is a this is a good way to think about it. Uh, important to note here, the composition law is a, it's a morphism of infinity group points, so like this continuous map of spaces, or it's all of that structure. Okay, so, and again, let me quickly mention functors. And I'll get the informal kind of definition. First, so a pointer of infinity one categories. Consists of for any object C and C. Uh, you have an object of C and D, so it's basically like a mapping on objects, just like for an ordinary category. And then, um, for any object C1, C2, and C, a morphism of infinity group weights on Hans. Right? So this is a morphism of, of infinity group weights. Now, again, in ordinary category theory, you would now impose some conditions, right? You would say it's compatible with composition, which is an equation at the level of one morphisms. As you would expect, and that's kind of an argument perspective, that's illegal. So we have to uh, instead specify even more data. So this assignment is compatible with composition. And up to coherent homotopy. So lots of additional data. Right? You probably feel kind of unsatisfied. It's not really telling me what is this additional data? How do I do that? And again, I think uh, the most efficient way to do it is probably in terms of synthesis again. So there are there are methods to kind of keep track of this all at once in a, in a uh, manageable way. Yes. Yeah. So, like, as from the Yeah. So I can think of like a function as and then the more that I have are not like they're like you can just have so you're saying consider spaces as a infinity one category. Like I thought that uh, like infinity is very Um that's right. 
And so an infinity one category you should think of as a one category that's kind of enriched in so Hom's one infinity group voids or spaces in composition kind of respects that initial structure. I guess masking like question I think that they So let me let me give an example. Infinity group voids or spaces themselves form an infinity one category and very well-known construction and homotopy theory, right? If I have two reasonable spaces, I can construct the mapping space. I see. So this is that kind of thing, right? right? So for example, I can take C to be spaces or infinity group voids as a, as a category, um, you'll have kind of internal HOM, right? Which would be mapping spaces. Another example, I'll talk about examples in a minute, but another example would be like complexes, okay? Mm -hmm. Between two complexes, I can construct a complex of Homs, right? And to any complex, I can attach a space using this dual column construction. Natural way to attach a space to a complex. So that's under the yeah. yeah. So for the analogy with like group point, normal group point and categories, mm -hmm. um, the Homs are just like special kinds of like just, just a set, right? Yeah, exactly. So is it is it weird longer that we don't have any points to be homes? Um well, like you said, in ordinary category theory, an ordinary category is exactly an infinity one category where the Homs are discrete sets, right? Where these are, are the most trivial kind of space to discrete spaces. So quick word about concrete models and then I won't talk about it anymore. So um, concretely, it's all this is not really, these aren't, uh, rigorous definitions and say a word about how to do that. So, um, you model going to be one categories. There are a variety of models, but probably the most popular one uh, uses superficial sets. So, it's some alternative, different model structure on superficial sets than the one we use for the faces. Um, and the fiber and objects are these things called quasi categories. So, this is the keyword here. And uh, this is what, for example, Larry uses in his books. Okay. Very convenient model. Um, nonetheless, you know, it's, it's very much a contingent set theoretical model. It's not intrinsic. Like the, the simplicial set, it has some set of zero simplices and two simplices and n simplices, right? And those are not intrinsic invariants of the category. Those are some, it's sort of like if I, Set of a vector space is, you know, uh, or like a yeah, it's sort of as, as if I set up and find a vector space is like um, the as as like part of or something like that. It's not intrinsic. It sort of uses some additional uh, uh, there's some additional data implicit there, which is the basis here. Realizing an infinity category as a quasi category as some specific special set is really like making some arbitrary choices. <laughs> Okay, but you can work on this, right? Uh, another way to do it, um, sort of more intrinsic, is if you already know what a space is, you can build, or what an infinity groupoid is, you can build infinity one categories out of infinity groupoids using what are called complete Siegel spaces. So this, I, this kind of concept it builds uh, infinity one categories out of infinity groupoids. And again, if you if you know what an infinity groupoid is, you can define complete sequel spaces in a way that's totally homotopy invariant or intrinsic. And that will, and this kind of can even be iterated. So if you're wondering, you know, how does this process continue? You want to define infinity n categories. Uh, this will work. So basically, in the complete Siegel space model, um, an infinity one category is a certain certain kind of simplicial infinity. Group. It's like infinity one categories are simplicial infinity one group void sets from simplicials. So if you want to define infinity two categories. They can be defined as simplicial infinity one category sets of conditions, uh, really conditions, certain statements. Um, in in higher category theory world, that means like, you know, 
the answer is a, a, a what do you say? Like, yeah. I kind of said that that was that was not allowed, but uh, in, in this world, it's sort of sometimes um, uh, the answer is unique up to a contract. Right, it's better to see than you know. So, uh, if you want to kind of check some of these things that I'm going to say about the 51 categories, it's a good exercise to try to kind of check these sorts of statements in the language of complete sequence spaces because you can really, again, do things in a totally invariant way. And a lot of the things that I'll say can be pretty easily dispatched if you have a basic understanding of spaces and you. you all right, any questions? I guess I'm close to break, right? Three minutes. Um, I think this would actually be a good stopping point, maybe, for, for the breaks. Yeah. Okay, so that was foundations. Half the time. I could have predicted that. It's just too much like babble about. Um, so we'll try to make some more precise statements. So uh, here's some examples. So as was already mentioned, uh, an ordinary category, which is in the kind of uh, this language I mentioned earlier, that's a one one category. Like a category in the sense of the point. Uh, and you view it as an infinity one category with uh, discrete hops. So the space of the infinity group void of maps from one object to another is actually discrete, equivalent to a set. So we're going to category here is contained within this. Um, any infinity group void is in particular an infinity one category. Of course, it's exactly an infinity one category where all the one morphisms are included. Comment there. Um, okay, so can I write lower down on this board, or is it going to be hard to see? Yeah, I'll write down. We can we can see that. Um, uh, yeah, there's some camera tilting that will have to be done, but yeah, everything okay. that was yeah. All right, I'll try. I won't go any lower than this. So um, I'll write the RPD for the infinity one category of infinity group voids. So infinity group voids themselves. A symbol into an infinity one category. Anyway, as, as we were just talking about, a, uh, if I have two infinity group voids, two spaces, right? There's some internal mapping space between them. Or in the language of group voids, when you think about it as a category of functors or something like that, there's kind of inner on there. And that makes these things into an infinity one category. So we'll refer to this a lot in the future. Um, uh, a little more generally, right? You have the infinity one category of infinity one categories. As you can imagine, when you start talking about some things, you will inevitably run into set theoretical issues or issues of size, you know, Russell's paradox and that sort of thing. And I'll completely ignore that because. The methods that you know are well known to resolve these in kind of from classical mathematics is here, you know, spending time on. So a very useful move to consider the totality of infinity one categories as an infinity one category in its own right. Um, and I should be more specific here. So sorry, another question. Spot. So two iso. Uh, sorry, two morphisms. In this infinity one category, are invertible natural transformations. So this construction does discard some information. Okay, 
right? I can, it's possible to have invertible, non-invertible natural transformation between functors, but I don't consider those. And if I discard those, then the, like, the, the functors, sorry, the, yeah, the, the functors between two infinity categories form space. Okay. Well, this makes sense. It's kind of like, it, okay, if I have an, the category of ordinary categories, you would normally think about as a two category, but you can kind of truncate it to view it as a one category just by tossing out the non invertible natural transformations. Okay. You just kind of discard that two category. This is still a very useful thing to consider, as we'll see. Okay, so anyway, maybe this will help. Let me elaborate on this. So if I have two infinity one categories C and D, I can attach to this an infinity one category of functors. Okay, so here morphisms, objects are functors, morphisms are natural transformations, two morphisms are isomorphisms between natural transformations and so on. And in this language, um, in the infinity one category and infinity one categories from C to D, it's not quite this object, right? It's this includes these non invertible transformations. So it's rather kind of the maximal subgroup. They toss out the non invertible one lens. Okay. So this kind of suggests so, like, really at and be viewed as an infinity two category, but we won't do this. Okay. Because, you know, we can talk and about the is... category of functors between two infinity one categories, and that's kind of all of the two categories I need um, to encapsulate that into this complete structure of infinity two categories. Sorry. Is this sort of analogous to, yeah, is this analogous to the stacks where you just remember only the isomorphisms of moduli spaces of various kinds and you forget all the other morphisms that might exist like in the city category of vector bundles? Yeah, like... yeah, that's exactly this maximal subgroup point construction, right? You toss out non -invertible. There's always a maximal subgroup point inside of the category where you just discard them. One Okay, so is this is this group point category that is also called the infinity category of spaces? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Group point's the same thing as a space. Yep. Uh another Example that will be relevant for us. I'm going to call this vect strict. So here, maybe I should say um, uh, sorry. K is the field. So vect strict is going to be um, the infinity one category with objects being complexes of K vector spaces. And um, in this infinity one category, so if I want to properly call it an infinity one category, I have to get a space of work in two complexes. Um, this is kind of a really classical construction, right? So what I do is I take sort of the inner hom, okay, which is a, another complex, right? The mapping complex. And there's this classical construction, homotopy theory that attaches space to a complex called the Doldcon construction. So not really important what the details are if you haven't seen it before, don't worry, but um, formally you, you know, attach some special set to this complex and then if you'd like you can take its geometric realization to think of this space, but 
it is a space. Okay. And then composition of complexes is, is of course like strictly associated. With that. So it's definitely going to be in the category because everything, all the, the conditions are strict. So we call it strict. We'll give kind of a more intrinsic categorical definition later, but this is uh, equivalent to kind of the. Okay, so that's a bunch of examples. First, so good. An important construction is if I have an infinity one category, I can attach to it. It's called the homotopy category. So this is the ordinary, you know, one one category with the same objects. And the Homs, so in an ordinary category, that should be the set, right? From C1 to C2, Homs and C itself form a space. I just take connected components, pi zero, that space. And again, because composition is associative and unital and so on up to pointer and homotopy in C, once I pass the connected components, it will be associative and unital on the It's really a category. So this is like a truncation. I throw away all of the higher categorical data. So even though, you know, again, they contain all this extra data, you can always throw it away and extract ordinary data, right? Okay, so from now on, to save chalk and my voice, I will just use the term category to mean infinity one category. And if I want to talk about one one categories, I'll call them ordinary categories. Likewise for dependence. Okay, otherwise it just gets repetitive. Okay. All right, so I, at this point, you know, we can, I can keep going and give all these basic definitions. At a certain point, you'll see the, the flavor, which is a really nice thing, actually, which is that this theory it behaves very similarly to ordinary category. You really use the same intuitions, like the same arguments. Or obviously, like the, the setup is more complicated, but in the end, a lot of the same kind of things. What? Yep, please. One zero. One zero. Okay, so definition counter uh, of infinity one categories is really faithful. Okay, pretty easy to kind of imagine what it should be. So for any object C1 and C2, the map of infinity groupoids of spaces, right? On homs is an equivalence of groupings. For an homotopy theory language, that means a homotopy equivalence of spaces. And so now this is what we do in ordinary category that we require a bijection. But notice here um, the concept of like a faithful functor, for example, doesn't really have a clear analog, right? Like being injective or yeah, being injective or surjective is actually not a homotopy in the real property. So in some sense, it's kind of difficult to, to say even. So fully faithful, it's still very relevant in higher category theory, fullness and faithfulness separately, not Although you can formulate some analogs. And then in this situation, you have the expected fact that F equivalence 
depending on the ethics of the data that was subjected, just mutual category theory. Which is subjective means the same thing as usual. Subjective isolates in this space. Right? The meta lemma holds as usual as expected. So there's a naturally defined functor from C to area to think a little bit. What's the natural recipient of the meta? Well, the meta functor is something that. Uh, Basically, you know, take a pair of objects that spins on things on these, right? Here, since arms are groupoids, the target of the innata functor really be functors from the opposite category of seeds groupoids. Groupoids now play the role of seeds. Okay, this is really faithful. And again, it's kind of given by the same formula on objects. As in ordinary category theory, of course, in higher category theory, you uh, in ordinary higher category theory, you know you have to be more careful. This isn't really a definition of this functor, but I'm saying there is such a functor naturally defined. You know how you define it maybe depends on your model, but there is such a thing, and it's fully paid. It's given this way. It's not very exciting, but things are kind of as exciting. Uh, sorry, Justin, is groupoid one of those things that you've upgraded now to mean something else, or is it just a one zero category here? Sorry, say it again. Uh, is groupoid one of these terms like category and, um, uh, and where you upgraded higher, it? Higher infinity groupoids. Infinity groupoids. OK, fantastic. I think I defined it. Uh, Space, sorry. Well, it's still in the upper left here, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So I, I, yeah, I should have said it maybe. Yeah, there. Groupoid means infinity. Yeah. Oh, I see. Category of group. Okay, got you. Yeah, yeah everything is going to be higher by default, and the word ordinary will kind of refer to non higher. So, so fullness and faithfulness makes sense on the ordinary category because objective and subjective are both by one discrete space. Yeah, exactly. But if you take like two, Non discrete spaces, like you can have two maps that are homotopy equivalent, or one is subjective and the other is not, right? So it's not a homotopy. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I should just say kind of adjoints work as expected. I won't write it out, but you have this notion of adjoint functor. Um, from F of C into D. Is homotopy equivalent to um, from C into the right adjoint of Y to B, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, basically, in making construction of the higher category theory, because we cannot just make definitions at the level of like objects and morphisms, right, that would lead to an infinite regress, uh, we, there's sort of a short, finite list of operations which are permitted, right? One of those is going to be passing to adjoint functors. We'll be able to guarantee existence of adjoint functors under certain conditions, just like an ordinary category theory. Very powerful tool for producing new adjoints. Similarly, you know, you have limits and co-limits. So just like an ordinary category theory, you can define these. Uh, of I as some index category here. You can define limits and co-limits in terms of um, adjunctions, right? So any object, so there's some functor from category to category of diagrams, where I just sort of take the constant diagram, right? And then co-limits are given by the left joint to this functor, limits are given by the right joint. These adjoints, maybe they aren't, Defined always, maybe they're only defined on some objects and not others, but there's this universal property that's satisfied by limits and co limits, very much like an ordinary category. Right? So you can kind of reduce limits and co limits talking about that. 
An important thing to note here is that these limits and co-limits, they're really, they're like homotopy limits and co-limits. So for example, when we apply these constructions to complexes in that category of complexes, like a co-kernel in, in this sense is really like a mapping, not like a literal kernel. So these things, they have this, they're a homotopy invariant. <clears throat> Okay. Just fixing some terminology. C is called complete, uh, respectively co-complete. Uh, C has all limits, respectively co-limits. Obviously, you're supposed to say some incantation here, like a small limits and co-limits or something. Again, I'll ignore some of So this is you know, saying that these these adjoints exist, right? Great. And then a very important, one of the most like important facts in basic category theory, and also here, is the adjoint functor theorem, which says if C and D are co-complete, then a functor F preserves co-limits if and only if uh, uh, F admits a right adjoint. Now the right to left implication holds in any case, but if both categories are co-complete, then also the, the non-obvious direction in Congress. So any, any category or sorry, any functor that preserves co-limits will actually admit a right. Uh, is the co-limit, yeah, sorry, my convention is that left joints go on top. So co-limit is the left joint. It corresponds to the notion of direct limit, direct sums, co-products, things like that. Limits are like products and inverse limits. So um, this is the adjoint functor theorem. And again, this is an incredibly powerful tool for writing down functors. You can imagine given like, again, the kind of inherent complexity, the amount of data that's involved in writing down a functor between infinity one categories, it's very hard to do by hand. Um, but this gives us a tool. If I have some functor, I can prove that it preserves all co-limits, which happens very often in practice. Um, I automatically know it has a right adjoint. And I don't have to write a formula for it, or rather, the formula is given by some universal property, and I don't have to write it down by hand. Uh, a question regarding the index category. In normal category theory, um, we usually imagine the index category to be quite a small thing, right? In That's right, like yeah. A, do we have a similar sort of idea of what the index category is here, or is that lost in this case? Because it's all, obviously got to be all issues of size are, are going to be exactly the same as the word. So yes. oh, I, I I I mean I mean small even more colloquially. I mean they're just sort of like sequence cat, like you know the they're they're sort of um, host well, categories. There's some subtlety thing. here. So I mean um, you know sometimes you may want to take co-limits or limits over things that are. Uh, quite large. For example, when you prove the adjoint functor theorem, you're going to find yourself writing down co-limits over some uh, some comma category or something like that, written in terms of C and D, which may look quite large. And so there are set theoretic hypotheses here, which I'm ignoring, which are necessary, mm. right? Where which basically guarantee that you can replace these large index categories with some small categories. So I don't know if that answers your question, like. You, you no, know, I didn't know. Definitely does. So even in large things, sometimes and you, there's some set theoretical complications there that may require you to replace things. So, so even in classical category theory, we still take yeah. limits of rather large things. Yeah. Yeah, and and this causes set theoretic difficulties out for exact Rossi square root x type reasons, right? So, yeah, same same subtleties here that I I think are totally safe to ignore in the first place, right? Because you never actually take into account this. Anyway. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a little bit strong, but <laughs> okay. All right, so important fact here. The 
is that the category of categories has limits and colons. And this is an incredibly powerful thing. This is like one of the, the main reasons why higher category theory is useful in algebraic geometry and representation theory is because I can very easily just take limits and co-limits of categories. In ordinary category theory, this is highly problematic. I mean, you might talk about like two limits and two co-limits in the two category of one categories or something like that, but already it gets kind of complicated and it may produce kind of nonsensical answers at times. Whereas here, uh, these, these operations are really kind of, they produce reasonable answers. Okay. So you'll see this is like really, really crucial to the way, for example, we'll define uh, derived categories of cubes and stacks. They'll be literally defined as a limit of infinity categories, some diagram. So this is a really crucial thing. And it requires proof, but it's actually not. So in the complete single space framework, um, like I said, there's some kind of simplicial groupoids and the Siegel condition turns out to be stable. Turns out that the inclusion of the Siegel spaces in the simplicial groupoids has a left and this follows completely formally. So limits are literally just limits of the simplicial things like term wise. And then to compute co-limits, you have to apply this left to joint, which is maybe something Inexplicit, but nonetheless exists. <clears throat> okay, so you should think of uh, limits of categories as being something relatively explicit. Like it's easy to say what it's, it's some compatible collection of objects, right? In each of the index categories, the identifications that we apply the transition blockers and so on. Something fairly concrete. Co-limits of categories are something inexplicit. It's hard to say what, it's, but of course you can map out. Of it. You're using it, it would be useful when you also like, or could you say again, like, how one would get this proposition? Or it, exactly to like take limits of the diagram categories. Like, if I have, let's say I, I know it's what sheaves on a scheme are, and I'm trying to define sheaves on a stack. So, what I'll do is I'll take for any scheme mapping to my stack, I'll take the category of sheaves on that scheme. And as I vary over all schemes mapping to my stack, this makes a diagram of categories. And I can exactly take the limit of that, and that is going to be the definition of the category of sheaves. It's a compatible system of sheaves on all schemes mappings. You know, it's uh, also the way that you would define the index category. In that case, it would be the category of schemes with the map. Yeah. Um, maybe even you get away with schemes with a smooth map. Or something. <laughs> So it appears to eliminate all work in that case, all the checking of compatibilities. Uh, well, I mean, it's a definition, then you have to prove things. Right? It does make the, it makes the formula very easy to write. Um, but yeah, it's maybe, you can't say too much about it at first. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, sorry, and then you're saying yeah. that it's, it's a limit to that case. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, so to give a sheet for a it's like compatible system of uh, the sheep or a complex of sheaves on each scheme map into the stack, right? And whenever I have a scheme map into a scheme map into the stack, I can pull it back and there should be an identification there. But then there should be some infinite tail of coherence conditions. And this exactly uh, uh, keeps the bookkeeping device to take care of it. Yeah. And avoid the horror of like the Bernstein. I don't know if any of you looked at, but I mean, yeah, it's traditional approaches to this were, trust me, if you, if you think this is bad. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this I just abstract category categories, it does have co limits. You probably usually don't want to consider them. So, a more reasonable thing, I can consider. Uh, the category of token lead categories. So these are just categories that have all the limits. You know, so these would include things like all complexes of vector spaces, or all, all vector spaces, uh, but not things like finite dimensional vector spaces, or bounded complexes of vector spaces. Right? You impose finite conditions, generally don't have to sums. And so so this would be like big categories that have all directions. Okay. 
So this, uh, sorry, and I don't allow all all functors. I allow only co-limit preserving. So you should think of being co-limit preserving as really baseline condition for niceness. If things don't preserve direct sums, they typically are quite hard to work. An example of a functor that doesn't preserve direct sums would be something like a completion, which we know can be painful at times, right? And basically, you know, you can't pull direct sums through, it's gonna be quite difficult to with them. Okay, so this sort of sits inside of this isn't a fully faithful functor because I put a condition on morphisms, but there's some forgetful functor, right? And uh, this preserves limits, but not full limits. Okay, nonetheless, this category is uh, also complete. So what I'm saying is, Take co limits in the world of co complete categories, but it gives a different answer than if I took the co limit of my abstract categories. Um, typically, co limits here are probably the ones you actually want to. Consider. So, again, we'll see that often categories of sheaves that we care about will be exhibited as some co limit in this world, but it's not going to be the same thing as if you took the co limit. So, with limits again, it's something quite explicit. You can think objects easily, and it's the same as a limit in these abstract categories. But for co limits of categories, typically you want to be working as a co complete world. And let me just say there's a very important statement here. So, so just a quick question. Is an example of this like in schemes, the category of in schemes is co complete or something like that? Is what? Is this category of in schemes co complete or something like that? Uh, I don't know about that because I don't, if I take like a random co equalizer, I don't know about that, right? I mean, like schemes, category of schemes is certainly not co complete. So I don't really see oh, why okay. in schemes, I mean, there are weird equalizers of schemes, co equalizers of schemes. schemes. Well, there's sort of equalizers in the functor category and the category of pre sheaves on rings, right? I mean, so. Uh, co equal line. It's, it's co limits that cause the limits. Uh, are I see. Okay. Limits, co limits are yeah. But here, you should, I, I don't really want you to think about things like the category of schemes. I want you to think about things like the category of complexes of vector spaces, or right? Or complexes. Okay. So, sort of linear, for us, this will always be kind of linear examples. Um, yeah. Geometric kind of things like schemes, they tend to not. I mean, you can consider like three stacks or something that would work, but not, not something like schemes. Those are geometric. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Question. Is it all stacks thing? So, mm -hmm. like, is there an advantage to that approach to plot equilibrium? Cheese on stacks instead of saying like present it by like deployed and have it like a plot equilibrium sheet on the like on the deployed and on the basis or something like that? Um, or that would give you an abelian category, an ordinary category, yeah. right? And the thing is, you you really need to work with complexes. I mean. You know, for example, uh, you may want to work with functors, which are not exact, right? So if you really want complexes of quasi-coherent sheaves, you need to consider something like a, a sheaf of complexes, which is inherently higher. And this would inherently be all those higher homotopies to keep track of, and that's exactly what this is. If you instead consider an abelian category and you take its derived category, there's a risk that you'll be getting kind of the wrong answer. Like, not all triangulated categories that arise in life are the derived categories. So this exactly sheets on stacks are exactly the situation. So so in that case, the drive category for the guys that are providing it could be the wrong person. Yeah, absolutely. Like Asian words again, what the could be can be sentence for this bit Sorry, why this has full limits? Why it fails. Oh, it just it's it's a little hard to explain, but let's say I took like some diagram of Co complete categories with column preserving functors. And I took the column here, it would produce basically some garbage. So I just want to say it's like it's it, it returns answers that are not very useful, whereas you, you would get something nicer. So, for example, like the 
include you want the inclusion of bunkers uh, into the colimit or the natural like insertion mass into the colimit to preserve colimits and things like that. And for that, you need to take the drug. So it's a, I, I realize it's a bit abstract, but we'll see an example. Okay. But but so yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Last last question. I, I don't mean to hang on this. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's good. It's, I don't want to go too fast, um, and I know that's it's already probably happening. So please. If we if we take the um, category of all functors from rings to sets, all covariant yeah. functors from rings to sets, or something like that, yeah. and then consider the co-complete, um, like like the the the, the, the co com yeah the the category of co-complete. I'm not sure I'm actually saying, I'm not sure my question's well defined as I'm saying it, but um, if we introduce sort of all the formal limits in that category, right? That category which, already, um, already has a so, Sorry, do you mean an ordinary category? Yes, okay. Yes, 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 okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I was, I was going to say if that, you know, is, if that, if that, um, now I'm not actually, again, I'm not quite sure that my, my question is well defined. There was a construction, but I didn't have a question about it. So maybe I'll just shut up. So, so in functor categories, Limits and colimits are, are computed term ones, like level ones. So like right, right. I take like functors from commutative rings into groupoids, uh, and I take a diagram of such things, the limit or colimit will just be computed by taking the limit or colimit of the values, like in the most simple way. So so there you, you really do have all limits and colimits because they exist in groupoids and uh and things are simple. Yeah. All right. So the following proposition is going to, you know, the first time I saw this, I mean, uh, very confusing, slightly mind boggling. So I want to kind of emphasize this because it really does play an important role. Um, so let's say I have a diagram in presentable, or sorry, I should co complete categories. Presentable is the right set, right? Communication, but co complete categories. So I have some diagram, and I'll say, you know, Right, what it does on objects is like an index goes to the category sky, map of indices goes to the functor, which I'll call f by j. So this is some colimit preserving functor between the complete categories, right? So this is kind of the first two levels of data here of introduced notation. So by the adjoint functor theorem, or some maybe slightly souped up version of it. I can from this pass to a diagram in just regular categories. Okay, they'll be still co-complete. It'll be the same on objects, but not necessarily colon preserving functors. Where again, same on objects, but I send a morphism of indices to the right adjoint, which exists by the adjoint functor. Right. So again, the ind index. Categories here are still going to be complete, but these functors are not necessarily colimit. There's no guarantee of the right choice. These will preserve limits, but not necessarily. Right? So I can pass to this diagram indexed by the opposite category. And the statement of the, the, the proposition here is that the colimit, okay, over I. Maybe I'll write comma FIJ to indicate these are the transition functors, right? Of the CIs is canonically equivalent to the limit over I op with transition functors given by the right adjoints of CIs. Really bizarre looking. Really bizarre looking. So, and yeah, this, this is super fundamental in, uh, in, in a lot of the applications. So again, whenever I have a co-limit in this, so maybe this helps to justify why are co-limits here a nice thing? Well, for one thing, I can always pass to the diagram indexed by the right of joints, and that co-limit of the original diagram will be equivalent to the limit over the right of joints, which again is sort of a more comprehensible thing, maybe, especially if the right of joints are also nice, which in many cases they will be. And so even though I said you can't really compute objects in a co-limit, in this case, you can't because you've got this limit presentation. Okay. And this would be emphatically false if I didn't impose co-complete, if I took the co-limit here instead. 
you get, you get something totally different. And again, it could be kind of some garbage property. Um, so again, I'll go into this next time, but for example, you know, you may have wanted to find sheaves on a stack, right? That's like for any scheme mapping to that stack, I have some derived category of sheaves on that scheme, and then I have all of the pullback functors, and I can take a limit. Okay. If those pullback functors have left the joints, which will happen in some situations, right? Like for example, if I use shriek pullback functors for constructible sheaves, you always have the shriek push forward left. So that would tell you in this case that the limit over the street pullbacks agrees with the co-limit over the street push forwards. So it gives this co-limit presentation, which is, is, is useful for many things. For example, if I want to map out of the category, hard to do with the limit presentation, easy to do with the co-limit presentation, right? and vice versa. If I want to map into this category, I can use this presentation. You can, you can formulate something like this in ordinary category theory, by the way, if you use kind of like two co-limits and two limits in the two category of ordinary categories, but uh, you don't usually see it in those categories. Any, any questions about that? I know it's, it's a bit misdefined. So we'll see how we get to that. Okay, so that's Right, so that's kind of the end of the, the basics. Um, the next topic is moving towards DG categories. There's the topic of stable categories. So this is, I said I would emphasize applications of homological algebra, and this is really where homological algebra enters. The so stable category is the higher categorical analog of the Belian category. Maybe better to say a triangulated category. Um, in particular, we'll see whatever this notion of stable category is. The homotopy category of a stable category will always be a triangle. So it's some kind of enrichment. It's something that behaves like a derived category. But I think you'll see it's in many ways preferable, in many ways superior to the theory of okay. So Let's just go right away to the definition. So a category C is called stable. Okay. It satisfies the following three conditions. One, C admits finite limits and full limits. Okay. Finite products, products, which out the pullbacks. Condition two, C admits a zero homotopy. This is a condition, right? It's saying there's an initial object and a terminal object, and the unique map from the initial object to the terminal object is nice. So for example, this is not the case for the category of group points, because there the initial object is empty and the terminal object is like the contractible group void that's in. That's not but it would apply to something like chain analysis, for example. Condition three, and this is the one that's uh, really crucial here. So a commutative square C is Cartesian if and only if. It is co-present. This looks really, really weird. If you're used to thinking about ordinary categories, this like really rarely happens actually. It's like the most Cartesian I mean it can happen. It's, this is saying literally every commutative square is it's one, it's the other. I need to mark on this. Um, before I, I go into more details, very important point, and I realized, again, I said something that might be controversial, which is that stable categories are better than triangles. 
But here's one piece of evidence. Stability is a condition, right? No additional structure here. I just impose three conditions. Triangulated structure is, is it's a bunch of extra structure on a ordinary category. You have to specify a shift function. You have to specify this whole class of distinguished triangles. It's in, in many ways awkward because of this. And here it's everything is intrinsic, just impose conditions. A stable category is a particular kind of infinity one category, just like an alien category is a particular kind of ordinary. It's one reason why alien categories are so nice. Right? Okay. Yeah. Like nice when king environment for that, I can work with short exact Exact, yeah, with and long exact sequence with essentially you should think of them as like categories of complexes like the quasi isomorphism, basically like derived categories. Most of the, the basic examples of triangulated categories are derived categories, the dealing categories. We'll see some fancier examples later, but those are the key. So you should think about them as behaving kind of so instead of short exact sequences, you'll have like exact triangles and complexes that lead to like Yeah. So this condition will mean that it's a living funnel over a ordinary category, which is final? Uh, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you can say it either way. There's such a thing as a finite space, a finite, finite infinity group void, and you can formulate it that way, or you can just require finite limits and limits for ordinary categories, and you'll get the same. Oh. But it, it, so let's just say, so finite, finite limits, for example, are kind of generated by finite products and uh, and and fire products, just like a kind of, so that's a totally reasonable heuristic to apply. That so quick question. When was the, when did the extra juice from uh, higher category theory appear? Was it in the previous theorem that you just said, where you can sort of exchange limits and co-limits? Is that where you would, things would like not, would, would sort of fail or, you would have to you'd have to go one more one degree higher in terms of coherence um um because this is so like uh, this as you say in ordinary category theory there are just no there are so few squares that are both co cartesian and co-cartesian at the same time um that it seems a very bizarre constraint um uh, from the perspective of naive category theory but so when when what is being sort of when did the infinity categories um, give us this extra juice to give us something like this, and where where, where are they where are they absorbing the sort of? Um, I mean, it's it really has stuff. to do with intuitively. Again, if you think about our, our archetypical example, the stable category will be something like complexes. That's a maybe mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and there you can talk about a naive co-kernel of complexes, right? Which is like just at the level of chains, and that's not what we're considering here. A co-limit in this sense is like. A homotopy co-limit, so it's something like if I take a co-kernel in this sense, I'll actually get a mapping. Okay, and in that kind of situation, you exactly do see the sort of thing. That's all I'll try. I see. Like, this is the sort of thing where, like, uh, being an exact triangle of complexes is something is something that's more symmetrical, right? Like the mapping cone remembers both the kernel and co. It's, 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 it's exactly the same. It's gonna Weird symmetry. Really, see on in higher categories. Yeah, because there's not even a notion of shift in this. There's not even a kind of index like. Oh, but index. the shift, the shift will fall out. Yeah. So uh, me, that's the next thing I'm going to explain. So I'll I'll reformulate um, the uh, I'll reformulate this in a way that's maybe more comprehensible. So um, assuming so three looks really bizarre. So let me just say assuming one to two, one and two, I can define couple of endo functors. So on the one hand, I have the suspension functor. So again, this is a little bit loose, but you can make this into a real definition. At least on objects, it's the push out. Okay, I have two maps to the zero object. We need map the zero object, right? I take the push out, take the co-equalizer, right, of that uh, map of itself, zero map of itself. Okay, similarly, I can define Loops of C to be the fiber plot. Okay, this still looks very weird from the perspective of ordinary category theory where these things could certainly be zero. Okay, 
but in this situation, these recover something uh, non-trivial. If I apply this, for example, in groupoids or complexes or something like that, this is what's usually called suspension, and this is loop is loops. So for example, in, in the world of groupoids, finite groupoids, to be clear, if I apply this, I exactly get the um, uh, base loop space control. Exactly what this one took in the next video. And then here you'll get literally this is the base of the suspension. Okay. So again, beautiful, right? That these are just straight up limits and columns. Yeah. It's really everything is in, in terms of universal columns. Uh, and the reason for that is that these are, uh, for kind of normal reasons, these are adjuncts. So sigma is left with an element. Sorry, I was just gonna say the reason that the um that the that the zero times over C, that the zero fiber product over C with zero actually is interesting is because a map like like a map from 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 zero is gonna remember the higher like the homotopies between the between the, the two maps exactly. of zero, right? It's gonna have in all spaces, the higher if I'm talking about like pointed spaces, right, and I want to do this construction, a point of the loop space will be actually uh not, it's not just like zero counted twice, but it's like zero with a homotopy of half to itself, which is a loop. Yeah, exactly. Oh, but exactly, yeah. I don't, instead of an equation here, I'm imposing, I'm requiring an additional structure, which is a loop. So this has a non-trivial, um, you know, set of points and, and, and all the higher structures. Yeah, exactly. So it's exactly because these are really homotopy columns and respectively, you get some non-trivial structure. Okay, and so here's a uh, hopefully more kind of comprehensible characterization of stable categories. So assuming one and two, so if I have a category with finite limits and co-limits, it has a zero object, um, C is stable if and only if suspension is an equivalence. And that, by the way, is equivalent to loops being an equivalence. But that's sort of obvious because these are agile, right? So equivalent stability. So stability is, is the invertibility of the suspension function, equivalent to the loops function. We'll go on time. Let's say a few more things about some categories. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say more about this. So. Okay, so maybe, so again, I think it'll help even to clarify what's going on here. Let me write as a theorem something I said out loud earlier, which is that if C is stable, then the homotopy category is naturally trying to maybe again to emphasize, I should say, have a natural triangulated structure, a different additional structure on that ordinary category. Okay, so. Just to quickly say, what is this additional structure on a triangulated category um, it makes it triangulated? You have to specify a shift functor, right? Ordinarily, that's additional structure. Here, shift is going to be given by suspension, which again is actually a colimit. So it's not additional structure at all. It's characterized by a universal property. <clears throat> and an exact triangle. Um, is going to be it's going to correspond to a Cartesian or equivalently co-Cartesian square of this. So it's exactly saying that C one is the homotopy kernel of the map from C two to C three. Equivalently, equivalently C three is the homotopy co-kernel, the sort of like mapping cone of the map from C one to C two. So again, being in a being a distinguished triangle 
uh, is really kind of a property for a square of this form. So to be clear, to make a commutative square, I have to specify kind of a null homotopy of the composition, the map from C1 to C3. That's a structure, but then it's a condition to say that this is Cartesian or co-Cartesian. Does the forgetful functor to stable from stable categories to categories possess a left adjoint? It does. Uh, at least uh, at least in the, the co-complete setting. Um, mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure about in general, but in the, I think it I think it does in general as well. But in the co-complete setting, it's clear. So, so then the stabilization of an of a category of a yeah. of a category will be like will be the derived category or the stabilization yeah. will will is exactly that much. Mm. And like for topological spaces, will it be what spectra or something like that? Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah, really. but now I will I will come to the spectra. So exactly. Um. So, just one other little comment about this. Um, I think again, really worth thinking through like how these things work for uh, uh, complexes of vector spaces, for example. But, um. One interesting consequence of this, the stability condition, like I said, it implies that the homotopy category is triangular. But again, if you if you think about the triangulated category, even if you don't remember the definition, it should certainly be added, right? There should be able to add more physics to triangular. Yeah. Again, it's something like a category of complex. So in particular, a stable category should be added. Not totally clear from the way it was defined, but there's really a cute way to see that. So if uh let me just say that in particular, C stable implies that the homotopy category is added. And I think this, what I'm about to say, will hopefully give a little more insight into the meaning of the stability condition. So um, one, one nice way to see this is if I compute com from C1 to C2, okay, in a stable category, Sigma and omega are inverse equivalences, right? So I can do the following Newton manipulation. I can write C2 as omega squared sigma squared. Well, it makes sense, right? They're, they're inverse. So, and then remember, this is a limit. So I can pull it out of the second variable, right? So I get double loops of Hom space from C1 to the double suspension of C2, just because omega is a limit. Right? Pull it out. So what we see is that in a stable category, any any hom, which is a group order of space, is actually a double loop space. If you thought much about homotopy theory, you know this implies that it's kind of behaves like an abelian group, in particular. I zero is going to be an abelian group because look, then I zero this is pi zero of this double loop space. Okay, but that's by definition, right? That's pi two of the space itself. This is an abelian group. I choose an abelian group. Somehow making loops invertible, it's, it kind of makes everything commutative. Huge choice there just to get the pi two as opposed to. Yeah. Okay, I realize I'm just about out of time. Let me just think carefully about how to wrap up here. Let me give a couple of examples really quick and then I'll stop. So this infinity category of complexes of vector spaces is a table. So 
the co-limit, I'll just give a couple of important examples here. The um, push out this. If I take the push out, the homotopy co-kernel, which is a push out of a diagram like this, it's computed by the so called mapping cone. So this is going to be for location. It's also Cartesian, co Cartesian. Okay. And then, kind of symmetrically, the um, homotopy kernel, aka the fiber, right, is computed by the co kernel. Again, if you're rusty on your homological algebra, you may remember this is actually the code shifted by minus one. So this relationship is exactly like the essence of this, this stability. Okay. Uh, so somehow this, and this is an exercise. Okay. Highly recommend thinking through this if you haven't thought through it before. Why does the mapping cone have the homotopy profile? Should be able to prove that giving amorphism of complexes out of the cone is exactly the same as giving amorphism of complexes out of W together with a chain homotopy with zero, null homotopy. Of it's really how the mapping works. Okay, so and again, you see this weird symmetry play. If B and W are actually just ordinary vector spaces in degree zero, then the mapping cone will have cohomology in degrees. Zero and minus one. Cohomology in degree zero will be the co kernel of the original map, but cohomology in degree minus one will be the kernel. So how it remembers both. Right? Okay, and the last thing I'll say is that the category of group points or spaces is not stable. Again, this is analogous to the fact in ordinary category theory that the category of sets is not really okay. Here, um, see an example of why this is true. So for any object, right, I have a morphism to the loops of the suspension because these are adjuncts. This is like the unit morphism. So let me take the zero space. Sorry, though, Justin, didn't you say that 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 in the category of groupoids, the initial and terminal object are not the same? Yeah. Not. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Yeah, I already said that. So, uh, so for example, uh, this is the same point. Also, let me give another example. Thank you. That's much easier. But um, let me illustrate this point that loops and suspension are not an equivalence, right? So groupoids not. So maybe a better. Uh, just to save this, let me use pointed numbers. Okay. So like pointed tokens. Okay. okay. So then this will be more interesting. Okay. So, so that group point is really, I really said that yeah, pointed point space. Group points with the distinguished uh, object, right? That are preserved. It's preserved. So um, pointed spaces or pointed group points is not a stable category. Uh, again, I just need to see that uh, suspension or equivalently loops is not an equivalence. These are adjoints, so I have this uh, I have this unit map. Um, but if I think about what this is, suspension of the zero sphere. Remember, suspension always returns suspension of a sphere is the sphere of one dimension, right? So this is loops of S one. The loop space of S one is the discrete space Z, right? You have a you have S one as a pi one and it has no higher homes. Okay, this has two points. This says. Infinity is certainly not nice. Okay. So here you see for, for group voids for spaces, suspension and, and loops are very much not equivalences. However, as uh, Aaron mentioned, there is a procedure whereby you can actually formally invert the suspension functor, some universal process whereby you can stabilize a given category. If I apply this to group voids, we get the so called category of spectra that plays a really important role. So 
final question. I have a question, but since yeah. other people's questions from the audience get censored out, I don't know if I'm talking over someone. No, no, you're good. Um, so does that suspension um, explain, uh, you presumably actually like, iterate the suspension functor and like formally adjoin, like like replace the objects with sequences of suspensions, something like this? Yeah, um, to, so this, to this stabilization is like, um, so maybe it's better to say I invert loops. So it looks like, sorry, it looks like the limit of um, the sort of inverse system I get by mm. taking a sequence so, of right? Does this get some ex post justification for the very existence of the category of complexes? Um, the, the, the preference of the category of complexes to the category of, say, vector spaces or abelian categories in general, the, the passage from that to the category of sort of all these. Yeah. Uh, so if I, there's something that's intermediate between spaces and spectra, which is sort of the like connected spectra, which sort of those are to spectra as complexes in like non, non positive homological degrees are to complexes. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, so it, it's a bit like, obviously groupoids are more homologically complicated than vector spaces. Um, mm -hmm. so anyway, they, they have homotopy groups in, in all positive degree and negative homological degrees, positive homological degrees, right? And then somehow in oh, this process, you pick up homotopy groups also in all positive degrees. Absolutely. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so um, I know you haven't gotten to the DG categories, but I'm wondering if there is any particular advantage for working over um, quasi category instead of DG categories. Um, so it depends on what you mean. So when you say DG categories, do you mean like in the strict sense? Like. Uh, uh, yeah, for instance, like live category of sheaves or something like that. And and I, I consider it as an ordinary category, like enriched in complexes, right? You mean this kind yeah, of like, like you take the DG enhancement. Yeah. Or exactly. even right. something like yeah, that. Yeah, so the, the advantage is, and this is noticed, I think, by, maybe it goes back to this paper by, by Keller, um, it's been marked on by Drenfeld. So in that strict situation of, of ordinary categories that are sort of strictly enriched in complexes, um, you may not be able to, like there are maybe functors between DG categories uh, in that exist in kind of the higher category or quasi category world that don't exist as functors in the strict setting. And instead you have to do some kind of complicated model category manipulation, right? Where actually the kind of true DG functors will look like some hats or something like that, right? You have to do some formal, so they're, they're called like quasi functors or something like that. Um, right. Maybe you can, yeah. So, so basically it's um, like functors are, are genuinely defined between the corresponding infinity categories, but in the DG category world, you have to do some complicated uh, inversion or something like that. So that's, that's one reason. Yeah, speaking of that, um, I also have a question on on this DG quotient and the and its relation to um, the homotopy push out taken in the infinity category. Like yeah. we have two DG categories pre-triangulated, and we take the um, DG quotient, and then we take the nerve, then that would agree with the um, the corresponding infinity category. It's like the, um, the push out in the infinity category. Yeah, right. Yeah, but, absolutely. Because it's modeled, it's modeled in the mapping though. It's like a similar kind of construction. Sorry, when you say DG quotient, you mean like the the kind of like own interpreted in the DG category, basically. Right. But what happens if the DG category is not pre-triangulated? Is that something so, similar to you hope? Well, we we kind of don't consider such things, right? I mean, if it's not pre-triangulated, there's some sort of pre-triangulated hole or something. In, in, in nature, everything is, is kind of pre triangulated. Being pre triangulated basically just is kind of like this condition of having finite limits of or something. 
Um, right. You practice things. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if I have complexes, I can, of course, take their finite direct sums and take it on the Anything else? Okay.